Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to what week are we on? This is coming on week number eight. We just have uh, this week and then next week focus on the work and the economy. It's really our, our last kind of section. Uh, you're on the home stretch uh, for the class. We're going to dive in this week into gender uh, stratification. Uh, think about gender and sexuality is the focus for this particular week. So let me just provide you like a, I don't know, like a 10 minute sort of overview of some things. Um, that just kind of situate yourself for the, the readings for this week. Um, the first thing I just want to clarify is the distinction between sex and gender and why it's important to make that distinction. Uh, sex is uh, determined by bi biology, physiological differences between, between individuals. So that's all we're talking about. We're talking about, about sex. It's just physiological, anatomical, um, biological differences between individuals. Um, and then we focus on gender. Our focus is on social cultural uh, factors that influence um, who we are or cultural, cultural ideas of who people should be. So gender is, a, is more of a learned social cultural historical uh, kind of component and sex is more biologically rooted. Uh, the reason for making that distinction is that uh, historically, there's been a view that, you know, women and men are biologically distinct, and that is why we have uh, certain social arrangements. So, for example, this would be, let's go back in time when the viewpoint that men uh, should occupy leadership positions because they're more rational, uh, because they're biologically, they're determined to be uh, more methodical, more rational, um, more... Uh, able to make difficult, tough decisions and just being uh, more effective leaders. And that's biologically determined things that are going on there. Uh, and that women uh, should, should occupy different positions in society because um, their biological forces prevent them from being effective in certain positions and more likely to be effective in other ones. So I guess the idea is that bio biology has been used in the past to reinforce a system of inequality, of inequality of opportunities and inequality of, of outcomes. Uh, give you a quick example: the 19 uh, before the feminist movement in the 1970s, before Title IX in sports, which provided gender equity for funding and 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 parity or equity in sports in uh, high school and colleges. That before that time period is viewed that women were not physically capable of engaging in athletic sports, or at least not, at least there's concerns that if they became too physical uh, in engagement of, in their athletics, that they could lose their reproductive capabilities. Um, I mean, you look back to the 1950s and the rules of basketball for women, uh, the women were only able to take, I think it was three steps before they could pass the ball. So they weren't actually, they had the team set up in one half of the court. Uh, so three players on one, one half, the, the offense side, I believe, and then two on the other side, which would be the defense side. And women can only take three steps at a time. The belief was that if women exerted too much physical energy, that they would hurt their reproductive bodies. Uh, I mean, that, that ideology and belief about biology is so powerful because it, it prevented women from having the opportunity to really develop um, their physical self in that regard. Of course, now we see women competing in amazing ways in athletics around the world uh, in all kinds of different sports and competitions. So that, that playing field has becoming more level, not all level, but it's, it's changed because of ideas about, about, um, ideas about the athleticism of women uh, have changed for sure. Um, so that's kind of the idea of making that separation. It's important to make that separation so we can put the, the, so we can examine the role of social and cultural forces uh, that, that influence us and our ideas about, about males, females, and, and about gen transgender as well. A um, couple different examples about that sort of idea about sex and gender and making that transition, things that kind of illustrate it. Think back in the, using my, my face to face class as an example of looking at 1950s and ideas of masculinity and ideas of femininity. These are personality characteristics. These aren't you know, masculinity is not male and femininity is not female, but they, yet they're, they're characteristic. So someone who's masculine is more likely to be competitive, more likely to be a risk taker, uh, more likely to take leadership positions. Uh, somebody who is more feminine is more nurturant, uh, someone who's better good with verbal skills. And these become kind of components of, of the feminine side. So in the 1950s, you look at men and women in society in the 1950s, sort of the diagram I provide. So, okay, if this is where men were in the 1950s in terms of masculinity, have they changed becoming more or less masculine over the past 
uh, 60 years. And there, you could say maybe there's a little bit of movement. The men have become uh, engaging with other parts of their identity and self, uh, providing more opportunities. So they've become a little bit less masculine. At the same time, there's been a hyper-masculinization uh, within culture as well. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But then the question I raised, well, what about for women in the 1950s versus today? And then, the, I mean, students go to right, right away is that women become much more engaged in developing, developing masculine characteristics, uh, being risk takers, being competitive, and all these different kind of things. So that change is not based on a biological ideas. That change is based on social cultural factors that are influencing kind of the expectations and norms and values and ideals. And of course, that all links up to opportunities and those kind of things. Um, so that's kind of an, an, an example of that. Another one to think about, about how gender, we get socialized into gender without even being aware of it. I think, you know, looking at going to, a, going to uh, let's say, Fred Meyer here locally and looking at the toy aisles uh, or going to a big box store and looking at how kids' toys are dressed, going to Target, going to Walmart and looking at kind of the way the store is laid out for the girl section, the boy section. I mean, boy section, it's, it's black and it's, it's blue colors and those are the predominant colors. There's action stuff going on and all kinds of things going on there. And there's this clear marking that pink is over here, pink and purple, and it's girls, and here's all the different kind of ways, and that's communicated. So from a very young age, we were engaged in an environment that's facilitating this idea about being sort of pink and blue, sort of that, that sort of separation. The thing I like to kind of propose is that that's a relatively new thing. Uh, you think before the rise of a, a, a mass, mass consumption, uh, before we had stores that were doing these kind of things, uh, before it was more gender neutral. Uh, toys, kids would play with just their toys. But now we have girls toys and boys toys. That's a social cultural thing that's going on that's shaping that. The other thing that illustrating gender on the masculine side, talking about this idea about hyper-masculinity. <clears throat> it's a concept that started becoming a... Uh, looking at starting in the 1970s and 1980s and a couple of factors going back to the previous couple of weeks. One is uh, economic challenges that are going on in the working class community, manufacturing jobs going away, service jobs increasingly taking their place, uh, male privileges being challenged in ways that weren't before, so the rise of the feminist movement, uh, economic insecurity. So in this kind of an environment, men start to become, and representations of men become hyper-masculine. So a good example, I think, is G.I. Joe. There's been some analysis of looking at G.I. Joe in the 1950s and 1960s compared to G.I. Joe today. So things have been, this has been done with Barbies, right? So you take a Barbie doll and then you make her life size. You look at her proportions. And, of course, she's not – there's no way she's – this is not in a person. No one exists like this, right? The size of her, uh, of her measurements are different than in reality. Well, the same with the G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe back in the 1950s and 60s was – uh, the G.I. Joe had uh, made life size, had biceps of 12 inches, an average, probably an average male in that time period. Uh, today, the average biceps is like 26, 28 inches average biceps on these action figures. Uh, the Incredible Hulk, a TV show from the 1980s, was Lou Ferrigno. He was a bodybuilder, professional bodybuilder. Uh, he was a sort of a, a, you know, he's a bodybuilder, so he's just a guy, uh, but that's sort of the size of Lou Ferrigno. Well, you know, looking at action figures, uh, Marvel Comics, and Incredible Hulk in the 1990s, maybe 2000s, whenever that movie came out, it's this hyper-masculine sort of idea. So the question becomes on why are these changes going on within culture? And these are very powerful cultural ideas that are shaping um, ideas about, about gender, about, about, about men, about women, um, and that becomes an important thing. Um, the other thing to sort of include in this discussion, just sort of think about, I want to encourage you to think about the three theories, in particular about conflict theory and interactionism. This is a lot of interactionism stuff, right? It's about our perceptions, our attitudes, or our ideals that are situated historically, so they're all about the time is important, right? Ideas about, about uh, gender in the 1950s, so different than today, right? So many different um, opportunities, more moving more towards more voices in a discussion uh, of shaping kind of ideas about gender uh, than before. But we have all kinds of challenges too, right? So we have this sort of this uh, misrepresentation of women and men in the media. Powerful film, if you ever get to see it, it's called Misrepresentation. It's, a, it's an examination of representations of women in, in the movie industry. It's a powerful sort of examination. I think it's in Canopy, uh, if you want to check it out. 
um, or if it's not, it may not be in Canopy, but you may be able to find it. Definitely, it's on Netflix if you're a subscriber to Netflix. Um, but it gets a good visual. There's some other other, other videos in, in Canopy that you might be interested in. Uh, the Mask We Live In is about masculinity. And then uh, Gene Kilborn does a lot of videos uh, called Killing Us Softly. It's about advertising and marketing and uh, sort of that examination. Um, so a lot of powerful things going on there uh, for sure. Um, so think about the theories, you know, interactionism, the way that we get to know, the way we come to see, perceive and understand the world. And then from that interactionist viewpoint, we do not respond to the world as it is, as, as it is objectively, but it's rather our subjective understanding of it. So we have this world as it actually exists, but it's our perceptions of that world that shape how we respond to it. Um, and that's a huge thing that gets us into social and cultural forces uh, that come into play. And then conflict theory does that examination of, uh, in this case, gender inequalities. You know, where, where do they come from? How are they situated in an economic, political context? And thinking about those forces that, that come into play. Um, and then last concept introduced this idea of intersectionality, which is a really important one. So intersectionality is the idea of incorporating uh, into, an, into an examination of something, uh, race, class, gender, sexual orientation, and other areas of difference. So that when we look at something like we're, we're talking about women, or we're talking about men, talking about the transgender community, we're talking about race, that we, we're incorporating multiple identities within that. So if I were to say, well, you know, uh, somebody, a white male who is in um, his 30s, uh, how much more privilege or disadvantage does he have than a white male in, in 30s who makes $50,000 a year versus a, a Latino male in the 60s who makes $300,000 a year, right? So it's intersecting different parts of our identity and asking questions about how are those lived experiences much more complicated? So it's not just race, not just class, not just gender, but it's all that sort of combined together. So we see the world in a more complex and more objective way. Um, so that's just kind of an intro. I hope you enjoy this works, uh, this week's readings. Uh, pretty powerful stuff. Um, thanks for all that you do. Continue up. Keep up the effort for the last couple of weeks. We're almost there. And uh, the last week's kind of a slower week. Kind of give you the questions for the final exam. Give you basically two weeks to work on it. Um, so yeah, hope you're doing well. And if you have any questions, let me know.